Good morning, Community Gospel Chapel. Um, <clears throat> I first just want to apologize for uh, not being able to be there with you all this morning. Um, I had every intention of being there with you, but um, last last night I started to feel sick, and I just felt that recording this message um, and uh, sharing with you that way would be uh, the best thing uh, in this in this case. But um, I miss you guys. I wish I could be there with you uh, this morning and see all your beautiful faces in person. But I'm also grateful um, that uh, we have the technology to be able to uh, do this uh, in this circumstance and um, hopefully, you know, in despite me not being there, I'll still be able to communicate with you what I feel like God has put on my heart this morning for us all. So I hope the morning has been going well so far and uh, you're enjoying God's presence and uh, uh, that he's been honored and glorified uh, in our midst this morning. So before I get started, I'm just going to pray and then we'll continue with the, the message. Oh, Father, I thank you for your faithfulness uh, to each one of us. And um, Lord, that even when yeah things don't go as we planned, um, that you're right there. You're right in the midst of it, God, and you're leading. And uh, Holy Spirit, we just do invite you to lead us this morning. Uh, I pray that you would lead me as I share. And uh, as our church body is gathered uh, this morning, uh, Father, that you would lead them as they hear your word and that you would help them to uh, apply it, uh, Father, and uh, really hear from you uh, this morning. And so I just uh, want to commit this time into your hands, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so this morning... Um, we're going to be wrapping up our series on evangelism and uh, what what I'm going to be sharing on this morning is on missions. Um, you know, this morning may not be uh, sort of a traditional uh, message that you might hear uh, on missions, uh, but as I was preparing, I really felt like God was putting it on my heart to, to share what I'm going to share this morning and really getting at the heart um, of what God is calling us to uh, when it comes to missions and our role in that. Um, you know, for many of us, we're aware that our church um, over the years, you know, all churches are called to missions, but <clears throat> you know, we've seen as a small church many different uh, individuals go out into the mission field um, over the years, youth and older people and families, um, and things have, have changed over the last couple of years in that regard. <clears throat> but I really feel like this whole area of missions is something that's continuing to be on God's heart for us as a church family. And uh, you know, it's my my passion and what I feel like God's passion is to continue to trust uh, for for new uh, people to go out into missions, um, not just in our community, not just in our island, not even just in our country, uh, but, you know, overseas to different cultures, to different peoples. And that's something that we should be trusting God for and praying into and uh, hoping with God uh, to see that that come to pass again, that many many people would go out into the mission field from our, our local body of Christ. You know, sometimes <clears throat> when we think about missions, uh, we, can, we can have a very narrow view of what missions looks like. You know, we often see uh, the, the sort of old school missions photos of, you know, maybe uh, one person or maybe a family out in the bush somewhere in the jungle, uh, secluded, uh, no other white people around. Um, and you know, that is missions. 
but I want to encourage us and challenge us today that missions can look that way, but it can also look a myriad of different ways. And really, it's, it's just limited by um, creativity and being able to hear from God and innovate and create in different ways um, all over the, the nations of the earth. And uh, so I want to hopefully, uh, through this time, open our hearts and our minds to the possibilities of what God could be calling us into this morning. So when we talk about missions, the basic <clears throat> principle of missions is that missions is uh, sharing the gospel, reaching out uh, to a people or culture that's not our own, right? It could be a different language, a different culture, a different way of doing things. And so when we look biblically at, at, at missions, uh, we really see Paul as the first uh, missionary to go out. Right, Peter went primarily to the, the Jewish people, and God called Paul to the Gentiles, to people of different culture and different ethnicity and different ways of viewing the world. And Paul was called to them, and he shared the gospel with them as the first uh, missionary that we see in Scripture. One thing that I do want to touch on uh, briefly as we talk about missions is that, <clears throat> you know, missions um, has been done well at times, and at other times, I think, not so well. You know, missions has done in a way that's honored and glorified God and reflected His character, but also at times missions has been done in a way that I don't believe has honored and glorified God and been a representation of his character. And I think the thing that we need to be aware of and need to be careful of is that, you know, as, as potential missionaries uh, and as we go out into mission, that we need to be wary of and we need to be careful of not taking our culture and our worldview and our ways of thinking about things and mixing that up with the gospel and with kingdom culture and trying to impose that on other cultures and other people. Right? Every people and every culture <clears throat> has come from the heart of God. Right, And there's things in those cultures and those ways of doing things and ways of looking at the world uh, that, are, that are positive and good. And there's some things in every culture that, that aren't, right? that are not positive and good things. But I think God's heart for the body of Christ as we go and we share the gospel and we do missions isn't that we bring our own culture and try and uh, make a bunch of Westerners, right? But we bring the gospel. We bring kingdom culture. We bring biblical principles. And we help those people to wrestle with those truths and figure out what does this look like in my context and in my culture? How do I apply this? How do I live this out? You know, how do I live for Christ within my context and my culture? And that's not always going to necessarily look practically and outwardly the same as it would look in our western context and so i think that's something that is very easy uh, for us to do right is mix up our own culture and our own western ways of doing things with the gospel and present something where it really uh, forces people to become westerners not just followers of christ and I don't believe that that's God's heart. Uh, and I don't believe that, you know, essentially as the body of Christ, we miss out on these treasures that God has placed in different cultures and people groups when we try and force something on them that makes them uh, act and talk and uh, view things exactly the same as we do. And so we need to be aware of our lens of how we view the world right that at times um, 
you know, we're not necessarily viewing things through a gospel, biblical lens. We're just viewing things from a Western lens. And so we need to really look at the way that we uh, view Scripture and view the world. And as we do evangelism outside of our culture and our context, <clears throat> we need to be aware of that and be careful of that. And, you know, the, the principles um, are what are really important right the essentials the principles and as I was preparing this message I was reflecting on how you know really that's what this whole series has been about right it's about asking the questions about why we do the things that we do figuring out the principles of them what's God's heart behind them right what are the what is the core of them what are the essentials because when we understand that, and we understand the principles behind what we do, right, the practical outworking and the ways that we do things, those can change, right, depending on the needs and the context and the effectiveness. <clears throat> we can be flexible in, th in those things as we hold on to the core principles and we understand this is why we do what we do this is what God has called us to in essence but it could look this way and it could look this way and it could look this way right and that allows us to be effective in our 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 ministry and our living our life for God in different contexts whether that's here locally or cross-culturally uh, in missions throughout the world So if you want to turn, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be going through um, the book of Isaiah. If you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 6 uh, with me, we're going to start in verse 1. And I'm just going to read through to verse 8. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year of King Isaiah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, and this is Isaiah speaking, then I said, woe is me for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. You know, in this particular portion of Scripture, um, it isn't necessarily about missions in the sense of, of God is speaking to Isaiah about going to his own people, right? His own culture, his own people. But I think that there's important principles in this uh, that we can draw from, from that apply to really anything that God calls us to. But in particular, I felt like God was highlighting this whole area of missions. And so we're just going to go through this, this portion of Scripture and, and break it down a little bit, verse by verse. And starting in verse 1, right, it, it talks about in the year of King Uzziah's death. So Uzziah was a good king, right? Just to set a bit of a context of, of where Isaiah was at, right? King Uzziah was a good king, um, but towards the end of his, his, his life, uh, he let pride enter his heart. And so he went into the the temple and burnt incense when he shouldn't have, and he overstepped uh, his boundaries, right, as king. 
And uh, you can read more about that in Second Chronicles chapter 26. So basically, you know, Israel had this, this good king, this great king that honored God, loved God, let pride enter his heart, overstepped his, his boundaries uh, of being king. And uh, he was struck with leprosy and ended up dying in isolation. And so he had just died. Israel was without a king. Right? There would have been a sense of disillusionment and um, disappointment as suddenly they, this great king that they had uh, was gone. Right, And so Isaiah sees this vision of God. And we see this incredible picture of, of uh, God on his throne. I right? uh, saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Right, So we have this picture where the the majesty and the splendor, uh, the authority, the lordship of God is really highlighted, right? Sitting on his throne, his robe filling the temple. <clears throat> so in the midst of this uncertainty and even this disillusionment over the loss of their king, Isaiah sees that, that God himself is is king right that he has uh, he has authority sitting on this throne his robe filling the temple and then we have this crazy picture of the seraphim right a seraphim on each side of the throne uh, the the literal translation of the word that's used for seraphim means burning ones right and they're floating uh, it says the scripture tells us that they're they're covering uh, their eyes with their wings and their feet Right, that even these, um, uh, you know, created beings uh, that that carry some form of of majesty and splendor themselves, right, as ministers uh, from God, that they uh, are humbling themselves, right, covering their eyes, covering their feet, which would have been sort of the um, the the dirty sort of part. Of, of the body in that culture, in that context that Isaiah was coming from, right? So that's this sign of, of humility, of covering their feet and covering their eyes, that even them, the angels, these created beings in their splendor, uh, doesn't compare to the glory and the power and the authority, the majesty of God. And it says in the scripture that um, <clears throat> the angels, they're not even speaking to God, right? They're speaking to one another and they're saying, holy, holy, holy. <clears throat> in, in Hebrew language, uh, intensity is communicated through repetition, right? So if something is repeated over and over again, it, it, it's meaning that it's quite intense, <laughs> And so we have this picture of these seraphim, right, floating beside the throne, covering their eyes and their feet, speaking to one another, holy, holy, holy. And it says that the whole temple is shaking and smoke is filling the temple. Like, talk about shock and awe, right? Can you imagine what Isaiah uh, would be thinking in this situation, that he's standing in this throne room, seeing God on his throne and these, these angels uh, crying out, holy, holy, holy. You know, lucky for us, we do get to see what's going on in his heart in that moment. Verse 5, it says, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Right, Isaiah is saying <clears throat> in this situation that he felt ruined, right? For I am ruined. And, and in Hebrew, the, the, the meaning of that word is really to cease to be, right? To be destroyed, to cease. And he understood in the presence of God uh, and in God's holiness, in God's perfection, in his purity, uh, that he was unclean. 
right? That he had uh, sin issues in his heart. And he responded out of humility. And, you know, we can see this and we can look at his response. Woe is me for I am ruined. And we can say, oh, that's a bit dramatic. <laughs> right? That's quite a dramatic response. But I think it's an appropriate response. Right? Isaiah, he saw God for who he was. He saw the righteousness of God, right? He wasn't comparing his heart to other people. You know, Isaiah was probably a righteous guy, right? He probably lived a good life. He probably made good decisions. He probably cared for people. Um, you know, when he looked at his contemporaries and his peers, he probably could have said, you know, oh, I'm doing pretty good. But the fact of the matter is that as he saw God, right? And that's what we're called to do. We're not called to, to make judgments on ourselves and our righteousness and, and how we're living our life based on, on other people, right? Our standard is Jesus. Our standard is God. And Isaiah, he saw this and he recognized that he fell short and he responded out of humility, and not only did he respond out of humility for himself and recognizing that he falls short and that he had sin, but he also recognized, man, my, my, my world is broken, right? That, that there's people everywhere that are struggling uh, with sin and are broken in their sinfulness, right? So Isaiah, in this picture, we see him, he sees God, in his holiness and his righteousness and he's challenged by it right and it changed him it affected his heart and it affected his response and how he lived his life and i think you know maybe we uh we won't ever have an experience exactly the same as isaiah Right? But the principle remains the same in the sense of when we see God and we have revelation of who God is, of his holiness, of his majesty, of his lordship. Right, We talked about that last week, that uh, when we give our hearts to God, when we respond to him, that part of what we're called to do is to make him lord, Right, that he is king. That same king that's sitting on the throne uh, in all his splendor and all his glory, that's our king, right? And he's king of our lives. And we're called to, to make him that every day of our life. And so as the story continues, we see in verse 6, it says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Right? So we see these seraphim leave their positions in order to minister to Isaiah. You know, God sees the struggle in his heart. He sees his response and he's moved by it, right? He responds to Isaiah. He, he provides this solution, this cleansing, this purifying. You know, we see this picture of the angel picking up this hot coal and touching Isaiah's lips, right? This part of him that he was saying was unclean, that God ministers to it. He forgives Isaiah's sins. He purifies and cleanses him. You know, and it's, it's interesting that in that moment, like you think about a hot coal, right? And your lips, man, your lips are really sensitive. Like you try and drink boiling water and your lips uh, will burn, right? You'll hurt yourself. They're sensitive. And, but can you imagine a hot coal being put on your lips and how much that would hurt? And yet in this, in this picture, we don't see any mention of Isaiah flinching or cringing or expressing any sort of pain, right? But we see the forgiveness of sin. We see this uh, purity 
and purification of Isaiah. And yet he describes no pain. And I was thinking about this and, you know, I think <clears throat> sometimes we can, we can fear or have some sort of fear of, of God dealing with our sin issues, right? Because we think it's going to be painful and difficult. And sometimes we can resist and we can squirm and we can try and get away from what God really wants to do in our hearts and our lives uh, because we, we think we're not going to be able to handle it, right? And there's fear there because of the, the perceived pain that we might have to go through to get free of those sin issues, whether that pain is from having to ask forgiveness of people uh, that, that we've wronged, whether that pain... Um, is just having to face uh, different different aspects of ourself that maybe we we uh, are disappointed in. Um, but you know that that fear the enemy wants to hold us back from receiving forgiveness, from allowing uh, Holy Spirit's work in our heart to come to full fruition. And, and he uses that fear and fear of pain of God's purification of our hearts to hold us back, right? To hang on to pride, to not let people in, to hold God back from getting into those sensitive and those broken um, areas in our heart. But God, he wants in, <laughs> right? He wants to purify us. He wants to change us. He wants to equip us. Uh, to love him and to love others in mission. You know, I often think about <clears throat> in Perth, uh, when I was working with Youth with a Mission, uh, we ran a, a school called the Discipleship Training School. And uh, on every school that I staffed there, there was a week um, where the topic was forgiveness and repentance. And during that week, we would have teaching, and then there would be an application uh, day on the Friday, and each student would, would have a chance to really specifically and clearly uh, work through and speak out uh, sin that they <clears throat> needed to repent from and had never done so, and also uh, areas of unforgiveness in their heart where they could speak out forgiveness over different people that have hurt them and caused them pain. And, you know, for many students, <clears throat> and I, you know, I went through that as well. And um, there can be a lot of fear and anxiety. And, and really, I think what it comes down to is being known uh, for... Uh, who you really are and some of the things that you've done or things that have been done to you that aren't nice, right? Uh, they can feel really yuck. And there can be this fear around that. And sometimes <clears throat> the students would struggle and, uh, and like, oh, I don't know if I really want to do this. I don't know if I can. It might be too much. It might be too painful. But, you know, as people stepped out, and they uh, were courageous, you know, in, in, in naming, you know, the sin in their lives and repenting from it and confessing it and extending forgiveness over areas that uh, were painful, right? God did something incredible in their hearts, in my heart, as I went through that. And, um, you know, you would often... Uh, be talking to people uh, around the base and often people would know uh, that the week's topic was forgiveness and repentance because people would finish that week as they they'd done this and they would just be like radiating right just glowing um, just so free in who they were Right, and who God had called them to be, not walking in shame, uh, not walking in discouragement, not walking in bitterness and unforgiveness. But there was this incredible freedom that was just so evident just by looking at them and, and seeing the difference uh, in, in their demeanor and the, how they looked and how they were acting just a day before. 
And so, you know, I want to encourage us in the midst of us talking about mission and looking at this, uh, this story of Isaiah. Don't let, let fear of pain and fear of, of walking through pain uh, stop us from allowing God to purify us and to work on those, you know, those uh, yuck places in our heart. Uh, that we need the power of the Holy Spirit in to see freedom and to see wholeness and allow us to be equipped for ministry, right? To love God and to love others. Uh, moving on to verse 8, we see this incredible uh, picture of Isaiah's continued response. Well, first God's question and then Isaiah's response. And this is you know, really what uh, the core and the heart of what I feel like is on God's heart for us in regards to missions this morning. In verse 8, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. This is a fascinating portion of Scripture. You know, we see God <clears throat> with Isaiah there. And God is posing this question. Whom shall I send? Who, should, who will go for us? God, God isn't actually wondering, right? It's God. We've just established his authority, his kingship, his, his lordship, his majesty. Like God doesn't have to ask this question. But he does. And I think it shows us that... You know, God could do all of this himself, right? He could do mission himself. He could, he could, he has the power and the ability to just force us to do mission and to do the things that are right and good. But he doesn't, right? Because he values relationship and he's a loving God. And essentially God is looking for people that will say yes that will say yes to him, that will say yes to his call, even before they know what it is. Right? God isn't going to force us to do anything. And if you're waiting for God to compel you uh, to the point where you don't have any choice in doing the right thing or going on mission or following God's call over your life, it's not going to happen. Right? God's not going to force you to do anything. God is looking for individuals that will say yes, even before they know what the task is. Right, Because there's a deep trust and a deep understanding of who God is and who I am and who God's called me to that I can just say yes. Before I even know what he's asking, I can say yes because I trust him. Right, And that's the place that God wants us to be in. And here we see Isaiah um, responding and saying yes to God. Right, He's like that kid in the class that, uh, <clears throat> that is just so eager and so keen. Right, Yes, me, 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 me. Pick me, pick me. Right, We see this in Isaiah. And he doesn't even know what God's going to ask him to do. He just know, know, knows that God needs someone to send somewhere to do something. But Isaiah, he's had this revelation of God and God has touched him and purified him and done a deep work in his heart. And he's seen God and his holiness and his splendor and his majesty. And he's even seen his own faults, right? His own insecurities, his own wickedness of heart. And in that moment, when God is looking for someone Right? Isaiah saying, me, pick me, send me. And I think the principle for us is that, you know, God is looking for people to send. He's looking for people to call. And I believe that Isaiah is a, is a great example for us in his, in his response to the call of God. Right, that 
that for us, as we see God, as we have revelation of Him, and also as God shows us who we are, right? Even in our weaknesses, even in our faults, even in our areas of sin that God is working on, that God cleanses us, He forgives us, but He also calls us. And that He's looking for, for men and women of God young men and women of God, old men and women of God, to say yes. You know, that's what he's looking for. He's looking for people that will say yes. He's not looking for perfection. He's not looking for years of study and qualification necessarily. He's looking for people that have humble hearts, that have seen God, that have been changed by him, and that will say yes before they even know what the task is, before they even know what God is calling them to. In their heart, they're saying yes. That's what God is looking for. And you know, it's often difficult for us to hear God's call and his leading clearly because we can put all these boundaries and stipulations of like, God, I'll do anything but that. <laughs> right? Or I won't go to that place. Or I won't talk to that person. I'll do whatever you want except this and this and maybe this, right? And that puts us in a difficult place to hear God's call and to hear what he's leading us in when we have these areas in our heart that we've blocked off and we said, no, God, actually, that's a no-go. You, you can do lots, but you can't touch that. You can't call me there, right? And we, we rob ourselves from being able to hear God clearly and to be able to, to trust him and his goodness and his care as a father and trust that he sees us better than we can even see ourselves. And just say, God, I trust you. God, I say yes. Yes to you because I trust you and whatever that looks like. And God is looking, right? Matthew 9 chapter <clears throat> Matthew chapter 9 verse 30, 37 and 38 says then he said to this is Jesus says then he said to his disciples the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few therefore beseech the lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest right the harvest is plentiful there's many areas in, in the world that are hungry for the gospel Right? Many people are coming to salvation in Christ. And God is looking and he's looking for men and women of God to put their hand up and to say yes to him. Yes, God, I'll go. Yes, I'll sacrifice. Yes, I'll do what you're calling me to do. Even if I feel like I can't do it. Even if I feel like I don't have the qualifications to do it. Even if when I think about that, I just think about the ways that I could mess it up. <laughs> But I'll say yes, because I trust you. And I see that your power and your glory and your majesty and your splendor is so much bigger and superior than my weaknesses and my faults and the things that I think I can't do. I'm going to say yes to you, God. And he's looking for those people. Right? And we have this amazing promise that as God calls us, that he also says that he's going to go with us. Right, Matthew chapter 28, we've read this multiple times throughout different Sundays, right? <clears throat> it talks about, in, uh, in verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And here's the promise, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Right? That God is with us in what he calls us to. And we've all been called to mission in some capacity. Right? In Acts chapter 1, it, talks, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Right? So some of us are called locally to this community, to this island. This is our mission field for most of our life. 
Some of us are called, you know, to to BC, to the province, to that sort of geographical area, some to nationwide ministry, to Canada, and some to the ends of the earth, right? But what I want to challenge us with today is, are we in a place in our hearts where we're saying yes to God? Whatever it is that God's calling us to, whether it is the Jerusalem or the Judea or the Samaria or the ends of the earth, are we confident in God's power and God's ability and his sovereignty and his majesty and his splendor more so than we are in our own ability, in our own weakness, in our own inadequacies? Are we saying yes to God and whatever that looks like? And, you know, maybe everyone in this room is called to the local mission. But I bet not. <laughs> I bet there's some in this room <clears throat> that are called further away from home. And there may be even some in this room that have known that on some level for a long period of time and have struggled with that and have wrestled with that and have doubted their ability or doubted that they've heard clearly because they can't get over their own insecurities or their own inadequacies. But I want to encourage us today that God equips and empowers us for what he calls us to, whether that's locally, whether that's overseas, whether that's nationwide in Canada, whatever that looks like, that we don't go on our own, friends, right? We're promised that Jesus is with us, that Holy Spirit is with us. And God isn't looking for perfection. He's not looking for a bunch of qualifications and plaques on your wall before he calls you. God calls ordinary people that are willing to say yes. Because they've seen God. And they've responded to him. And they've allowed God to work in their hearts and their lives. You know, missionaries aren't necessarily incredible people <laughs> all the time in the sense of their skills and their qualifications. But I have met some incredible people because of their responses to God and continually saying yes over and over and over again, no matter the cost. Because they see and they have seen and they are seeing a deeper revelation of who God is and they continually respond to that and so that's my heart and my prayer for us as a body here that we would see God that we would respond to him and we would be a people that would say yes and whatever that looks like and for some of us I'm praying <laughs> Uh, that it is a call to missions because the harvest is ripe, it's plentiful, and God is looking for people to say yes to him. Amen. Well, I hope that, um, you know, this word has been an encouragement and a challenge uh, for, for each one of us. I know for me, you know, it has been for me as I've prepared and I shared this morning. And so I just want to pray and uh, wrap it up. Father, I thank you so much uh, for what you've spoken to each one uh, here this morning. And uh, Lord, we just want to say yes to you. We want to be a people that continually put our hand up like Isaiah before we even know what it is, God. We say yes because we've seen you and we trust you and we know that you're good. And so help us to do that, Lord, each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.